We want to enter into our worship at this time. We are going to begin our worship with a song. We are going to uh, begin with song number 139 in the supplement, One Heart, One Voice. And then after that, Brother Dale Brummett is going to lead our minds in prayer. Brian? Song number 139. Mm -hmm. Sing his praise, sing and give him glory. Our Father, we thank you for being our God. We know that you are there. We know that you are watching over us. We know that you care. And this morning, as we worship you, we pray that we, we do so with one voice and that we glorify your name. Thank you for this opportunity to be together. We thank you for each one here. We pray for those of our number that are not here. We pray if they're traveling that you would keep them safe. That if their health is not good and it's keeping them from us, we pray that you would heal them. If not, though, we pray that they would lean on you, that you would help us to be aware of, of their needs, that we might also be one in everything that we do. As your, as your family, as your church, as your people. We thank you for your word, and we, as we think about you and we think about how that you have preserved your word and you have given us guidance in life and you have given us hope in life, your word is precious to us, and we, uh, we honor you your word, we honor your plan through your son, and we ask that you would be with us as we this morning think of him and the blessings that we have in him, and because of his sacrifice, the hope of eternal life with you. We thank you for all these things, and we pray that I you would guide us today, that what we do would be pleasing to you, and we pray this in the name of your Son, amen. amen. Our next song is out of the big songbook, uh, the 90 and 9, song number 123 in the big songbook, the 90 and 9. 
99 that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. The one was out on the hills far away, far off from the gates of gold. Away from the mountains wild and bare, away from the tender shepherd's care, away from the tender Shepherd's care. Lord, thou hast seen the ninety and nine, are they not enough for thee? But the shepherd may answer, this of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. I go to the desert to find my sheep. But none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed. No, the dark was the night that the Lord passed through, through me and his sheep that was lost. Far out in the desert he heard its cry, Twas sick and helpless and ready to die. Twas sick and helpless and ready to die. Lord, whence are those ball drops all the way that marks out the mountain's track? They were said for the one who had gone astray ere the shepherd could bring him back. Lord, whence are thy hands so rent and torn? They're pierced tonight by many a thorn. They're pierced tonight by many a thorn. But all through the mountains thunder riven and up from the rocky steep. There arose a glad cry to the gates of heaven. Rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed around the throne. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. As we have gathered here this morning, we have gathered here to remember the sacrifice of our Savior, to remember his death, his burial, but to remember his resurrection, to remember his ascension. We praise thee, we thank our Father for this, and we want to go to him at this time in prayer. Our Father, we wish to glorify thee for the gift of your son, for the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. We praise thee, we thank thee for the resurrection, for in Christ's resurrection, for in Jesus' resurrection, we have a hope, we have salvation, we have every spiritual blessing that you bestow upon us through your son, through that resurrection. And we wish to glorify thee for that sacrifice 
We praise thee that Jesus sits at your right hand. We praise thee that he rules, that he is our head. And we are so thankful. We're thankful at this time for this bread, for it represents to each of us the body that he gave upon the cross. And we are so thankful and we pray that you would bless it to us, that you would forgive us, that you would watch over us, but that we would partake of this worthy. And we just are so thankful. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. Our Father, Jesus came by your will. He lived his life. He gave up his life. He shed his blood upon the cross. We are so thankful for the blood that he shed, for that sacrifice, for in that we have salvation, we have uh, reconciliation, we have all things through the blood of your, your Savior that you gave to us through, through Jesus. We are so thankful. We praise thee, and we pray that we would partake of this in a worthy manner, that we would partake of this remembering the blood that was shed for us. We're just so thankful. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Our next song is song number 138 in your supplements, The Army of Our Lord. 
one, three, eight. Do. O men of age, O men of youth, lift up your idle sword. Come fight with us who fight for truth, the army of our Lord. Our Lord sees every Christian die and feels each dying breath and calls out from the field nearby, be faithful unto death. Our elders long in battle years, alas, begin to fade. But from the ranks young men appear and leave their first crusade. Our brethren dead beneath the plain whose spirits never died. Rise up to march and shout again O Christ, be glorified. O Christ, be glorified. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 5. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Our next song is back over in this book, song number 92, Others, 9-2. Do me so. Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others, others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be, help me to live for others, that I may live like thee. Help me in all the work I do to ever be sincere and true, and know that all I do for you must needs be done for others, others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live like thee. Let self be crucified and slain and buried deep and all in vain. Lay effort feet to rise again, 
unless to live for others, others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be, help me to live for others, that I may live like Thee. And when my work on earth is done, and my new work in heaven begun, may I forget the crown I've won, while thinking still of others, others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be, help me to live for others, that I may Our next song is Servant's Song in the Spiral Supplements, song number 97. And if you're able, would you please stand while we sing Servant's Song. No. your son for he was a servant please make me one make me a servant do what you must do to make me a servant Shine with your light. Show me your footsteps and what I should do. Now and forever, make me like you. Please be seated. The song after Chris's lesson will be song number 550 for Christ and the Church, 550 in your regular hymnals. Over the last few months, our sermons have predominantly, at least the ones that, that I have been doing, have been almost exclusively focused on various holidays within the Jewish and Christian calendars. Uh, we've looked at Purim, 
uh, talked about Lent and Palm Sunday, Easter, Easter again, and uh, even though not officially what we would call a holiday within the church calendar, um, last lesson that I did a couple weeks ago was focused on Mother's Day. In that time, we've also had a couple of guest speakers, uh, so it would make sense, and you would be forgiven if you had forgotten that actually the church calendar sermons was not actually the primary focus thematically for the year. We actually began with a larger primary theme that we were working with and working through for this year, and that is how to create an evangelistic church. And by that, not the how-to um, as far as the nuts and bolts of getting out and talking to people and doing all that, that'll come in time. Before you can create an evangelistic church, you must have a group of people, a congregation, that is inviting to people. That is, that when they come and they see it, they remark, uh, just as Jesus said in John chapter 13, see the love that they have for one another. Therefore, we have, before talking about the nuts and bolts of evangelism itself, we focused on how to be united as a group, how to handle differences in thought, um, how to handle times when we disagree with each other. We looked at the unity of the earliest church in the early pages of Acts and the things that they had in common with one another, how they acted with one another, but also the problems that came up in the earliest church and how they handled those various problems. Just to remind you, this is, I think, incredibly important. It really is the main theme for what I have been trying to talk about for this year. What I want to do this morning is get back to talking about how this church should work together as a whole so we can create the atmosphere that looks and feels like the atmosphere of the earliest Christians, to the closest that we're able to do so. One that not only holds to the truth of God's word, but does so demonstrating a unity of mind and the level of grace towards each other that people will see and they will want to be a part of it. To do so this morning, getting back to uh, this whole topic, I want to talk about the relationships that we share here, beginning by the discussion that I believe is vitally important to understanding the way that a church is to operate, and that is to understand the proper work and place of the elders or the leaders within the church. So I want to start this series, this series that's going to look at elders in light of the New Testament, who are the elders? What do they do? Who should be an elder? What is the church's responsibility to the eldership? These are the kinds of questions that I think we need to discuss as we continue to look at the relationships that make an effective church of Christ. So starting this morning, let's spend some time looking at the nature of eldership according to the New Testament. Good morning. It's good to be here this morning, isn't it? It's good to be here together, to open up the Word of God together, to have this opportunity to sing these songs together, to take the Lord's Supper and remember the Lord's death together, and really just to enjoy the fellowship that we share. Uh, I really appreciate all of you and uh, that we have this opportunity to be here and that you have given me the opportunity to open up the Word of God with you this morning. We do have some who are visiting with us, and uh, we are really glad that you're here this morning, that you've chosen to be with us. Uh, we really appreciate that. It makes us feel special, because quite frankly, there's a whole lot of places you could have gone, things you could have done, but you chose to be here with us, worshiping God, and that makes us feel pretty special. We hope you will be encouraged by the time that you spend with us this morning, and uh, as we continue to talk about how to be an effective New Testament church. Now, obviously, we know from Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11, that the elders are a gift from God to the church, from, from the Spirit. It says, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. So one of the earliest gifts given to the church and that is still around today is the eldership. Uh, the apostles, we don't have apostles necessarily walking around in the same way. I don't believe that we still have prophets who are giving the inspired word of God, a, a brand new revelation that's never been revealed before and giving those to the churches. Uh, we do have evangelists. I believe I am one of those <laughs> that uh, is talked about right here, a, a class of leadership and help and training instruction within the church. But then you have these final two that are given, shepherds and teachers. And I, I want you to notice how shepherds and teachers are different. At least the teacher's part is different. Um, I like the way the New American Standard puts this. I didn't put it up there. But it, it says, and some as, and some as, and some as, instead of the, 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 right here. Um, if I were in this translation, I would put and the, and the, and the, because literally that's what's there uh, in each of these, except for the word teachers. That doesn't have anything before it like all the others. There's no definite article before the word teachers, which I believe, and uh, throwing out a little bit of grammar here for you grammar nerds, here's your bone for the day right here. Uh, I believe that shepherds and teachers, the word teachers there is actually an apposition, uh, that the teachers are the shepherds, and the shepherds are the teachers, according to this structure right here. The teachers is not a separate category. There aren't five gifts that are given, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. It's apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then shepherds, who are the teachers, is the way that I think this is supposed to be understood, given the grammar that's here. So really, I believe that the main bulk of teaching that comes to the congregation is supposed to come through the shepherds and through the elders. And keep in mind, teaching doesn't always mean the person that's standing up front, the person that's delivering a lesson, the person that's standing behind a lectern here leading a Bible class. There's all manner of teaching that takes place, instruction that takes place that shepherds or elders do, often on a one-to-one -one basis, talking to someone, helping them, leading them, uh, that is supposed to be a part of what is done. And keep in mind um, that these shepherds and teachers, their purpose is, or the teaching is, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. This isn't a description that you see right here of people whose sole job and responsibility is to make decisions for the church. And I think it's important that we understand that. As elders or shepherds are talked about, we do not choose shepherds to be the decision makers for the church. Now, there are going to be times that, yes, they will make decisions, but decision making for the church is not the primary role. The primary role of elders or shepherds within a church is teaching in such a way that the saints, that is the members of the church, are equipped and they are built up and that the body of Christ is strengthened because of their leadership. This does not describe a board of directors or a CEO, a uh, group of CEOs or whatever in a congregation. This is descriptive of people who are given a spiritual charge of those under them to build up the entire body of Christ. When we talk about this idea of elders, I think Acts chapter 20, there's a couple passages that will help us to maybe get a better grasp of this by looking at the various terms. You'll notice that quite often I use the word elder in the last passage that we looked at, even though Paul uses there the word shepherd. And that's because these words are used interchangeably of these people. In Acts chapter 20, verse 17, uh, this is while Paul's on his third journey, what we call his third journey, and he's making his way back to Jerusalem, and uh, he stops in at Miletus near Ephesus, 
And he called the elders of the church to come to him. And he gives them a whole lot of instruction. What I want to focus on uh, for the point of what we're getting across in verse 28, he says, pay careful attention. Remember, this is the elders, very specifically, not the church of Ephesus. This is the elders of the church. And he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. In this passage, you have actually three different words that are connected to what we call eldership, or being an elder. Uh, verse 17, he called the elders. Verse 28, uh, the Holy Spirit, he says, has made you overseers to... Then, and by the way, the word overseers here is uh, a word that can also be translated as bishop, uh, in case you've ever heard the term bishop. This is the word uh, that bishop comes from, the overseer, or the word bishop. He says to care for, um, perhaps another way to translate care for uh, would be to shepherd, which is really the word that's there. If I if I were using the uh, CSHV, this is what I would use, is the word shepherd here. Um, in order to shepherd the flock, or the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. This is translated to shepherd. And keep in mind, shepherd here is not a noun. This is a verb. This is an action. This is a work. This is a responsibility or a duty. This is what it is that they are doing. And uh, another word for shepherd here is the word pastor, where we get the term pastor. If that's a term that you've heard before, the word pastor, this is what it is right here. It's simply another word for shepherd. And so in this passage, he talks about elders. He talks about overseers or bishops. He talks about shepherds or pastors. All of these words are used interchangeably about the same people. So you see this in Acts chapter 20, um, and you see it also in a passage that was read for us just a few minutes ago in 1 Peter chapter 5, the first couple verses. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight. So here we have these three words yet again, which are all used together. Uh, and are all used of the same people. He talks, this is uh, Peter talking to the elders. I exhort you, I encourage you, you elders that are among you. He says, uh, shepherd the flock of God. Again, the word shepherd is also the word pastor. If we hear the word pastor, this is what it means. It's simply the word for shepherd. And it's a verb. Again, this is an action. Shepherd the flock. This is active. This is what they do, uh, exercising oversight. Again, the word for bishop, but again, here, this is a verb in this part. And so the oversight, uh, the overseer is the one who exercises oversight. I think it's significant that these words are all tied to active work because the role of an elder is an active role among the people. The role of an elder is not a role that is done passively behind closed doors in a meeting room with a, a group where you get together and you make all of the decisions. This is an active role being in and among the people. And many don't actually realize, I, I think, in the world at large, perhaps here, I think most of us here are familiar with these passages, and we're familiar with these terms and the way that these terms are used interchangeably. In Christendom at large, I don't think most people realize that these words are interchangeable. There are many churches, uh, again, at large, that have a pastor, a shepherd that runs the church. And sometimes you have a pastor who runs the church, and under him you have a board of elders uh, that serve in some capacity. I think it's very important <laughs> to make this clear, although by now it probably is fairly clear. I'm not a pastor. I was not invited 
to this group to serve in that capacity. I'm an evangelist in this church, and, and I help to a large degree with the teaching, but pastoring is not my responsibility in this church any more than it is anybody else who is not considered an elder. Then there are some groups in Christendom who have a bishop that they have set aside as someone who sees over many churches and the leadership within those. But again, within the pages of the New Testament, the words for the leaders of the church are interchangeable. They're all the same thing. And I want to stress that even though these are titles that are used for the church leaders, and I think it's important that we understand that, we do designate people and very specifically give them a title that says, we have designated you as a spiritual leader to guide us in the church. These titles are descriptive titles. They describe what it is that being a leader within the church means. And it's also, I think, important to note that we don't see places where you will find a single pastor, elder, or bishop who serves over a church. Whenever we see it described, there's a plurality that's spoken of. More than one. It's in the plural form. Uh, shepherds or elders. Thus we conclude, and I think very reasonably so, that the guidance of a church is not meant to be left up to one individual. So, let's take a moment to break down these terms uh, very quickly and, and make sure if these are descriptive titles, what exactly is it that they are describing? First of all, looking at the idea of a pastor or a shepherd, I don't know of a better place to go to than Jesus talking about being a shepherd in John chapter 10. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And here's what a good shepherd does. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now here's where Jesus sets himself up as an example of what a true shepherd looks like. Now, granted, the shepherds that we have within a local church are not going to meet up one-to-one -one with everything here. I'm not going to uh, look to Dale to grant me eternal life or anything such as that. Um, I, I, no way that Dale ever could grant that. We understand that. But what Jesus does is he sets himself up as the shepherd par excellence, the one that Peter looks at and says, this is how to be a shepherd, and then he goes to other shepherds and says, imitate me, right? Be a shepherd like I am, because he saw the picture of what a true shepherd is. And this is what a shepherd does. This is what a pastor does. First and foremost, he serves. He doesn't just make decisions for the group, but he lays down his own life. He sacrifices himself for those in the flock. He has a responsibility to lead the flock because they listen to him, they respect him, they follow him. This is a huge responsibility that's undertaken. And it should be important to realize that a shepherd cannot be a shepherd if the flock does not listen to him, if the flock is unwilling to follow him. Um, this is, I think, vitally important, and we're going to talk more about this later, and probably later again, so I don't want to belabor this. Uh, this also was talked about in the bulletin article, if you had an opportunity to read the bulletin article. But we don't look at qualifications in Timothy and Titus and say, oh, this person matches these, therefore he must be able to be an elder. What we are looking for are people who lead. People who are able to get within the flock that help 
that encourage, that strengthen, that protect. And if somebody is unable to promote that kind of following, if they're unable to interact, and they, they are maybe even just unwilling to interact within the sheep of the flock in such a way that they will not follow this individual, this individual probably has no reason to be an elder or a shepherd within that church, even if he can check off everything that you find in Timothy and Titus. Because a shepherd is first and foremost a leader and respected as such by the flock over which he presides. Now, again, I said this, something like this before, their leadership looks differently from person to person and how they manifest it and how it happens. And it's important that we understand that. Uh, but what this tells us is that an elder or a shepherd should be active within the group. First uh, Peter chapter 5. Let's read just a little bit more of this. We read verses 1 and 2 a second ago. But he says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but instead being examples to the flock. Now, eventually, this is going to have, I think, some definite conversation that's going to come up from this, but an elder is a leader within the congregation that does not lead by force, does not lead by saying, hey, it's my way or the highway. An elder cannot domineer over the congregation and say, you have to do what I say because I am an elder. That's not the way New Testament eldership works. That's not the way that Peter says to do it. Instead, he says, here's how you do it. You get out in front and you be an example of what it looks like first and foremost. And when they see the example and they see the wisdom that is being given and they see uh, what is being produced by this example, I mean, that's the reason you became an elder in the first place, right? Right? They will follow. That is the point that I think Peter is trying to get across here. You don't domineer. You lead by example, being in the very front lines and leading the rest. Um, how does a shelter, a shelter, how does a shepherd, elder, <laughs> or exercise oversight? All of this just demonstrates these words are intertwined together. A shepherd exercises oversight by knowing the sheep, taking care of what needs they might have, leading them. It's a matter of service. So let's talk about this idea of oversight or being an overseer, the idea of the word, uh, where the word bishop comes from. Paul, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, says the saying is trustworthy if anyone aspires to the office of overseer. He desires a noble task. So Paul, and, and what Paul's doing here in 1 Timothy, he's telling him how to handle it when men desire to be made elders within a church. Um, there's more to it than that. I think it has to do with Acts 20 that we talked about before, and uh, people rising up to take the church in Ephesus where Timothy is into apostasy. But We'll just kind of say, here's what we're focusing on right here. Um, Paul makes it very clear that the eldership is an office within the church, but then he also makes it clear that it's more than just a title, an, honorary, uh, an honorific that's given, somebody that just simply has a title of something. Once again, look to the point made in 1 Peter chapter 5, demonstrating that an overseer has to oversee. It's active. There is work that's involved. And it's not a management of everything that the church does. I really believe it is overseeing the spiritual needs of the church. In Acts chapter 6, 
Uh, this is not a discussion about elders. Uh, I think it's important that you know, we, we understand that. However, I think that that's the case because in Acts chapter 6, I don't believe there are elders in the church in Jerusalem at this point. We don't hear about elders in Jerusalem until Acts chapter 11. It's the first time that it's mentioned. And I think that's because at the very beginning, the apostles were the elders in Jerusalem because they hadn't spread outside of Jerusalem yet. Uh, the spreading of the gospel really doesn't take place until you get to chapter 8 and really not on a large degree until you get to chapter 11, which incidentally, by that point in time, there are now elders within Jerusalem as the apostles, I believe, have spread out of Jerusalem. Therefore, they needed to be replaced by a group of men to lead. All of that to say, I think the, elder, um, the apostles here are talking about the work of elders within the church. I think that's the role that they are discussing in Acts chapter 6 uh, in this. When they say, in those days, the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve, that is the apostles, they summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, others, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Um, I think that there is some real value of seeing uh, the relationship between what I call the elders here, the spiritual leaders of the church, and the congregation itself. Uh, we discussed this passage earlier this year. Hopefully you remember how we went into detail about all the stuff that was going on. This is a very serious issue. Um, and, and we can't read that the apostles are saying, guys, you know what, this, this is not a big deal. Just chill out and deal with it. You know, like we, Julia and I, might do with our kids sometime when they're making mountains out of molehills, right? You know, you, you're like, ah, calm down, guys. No, this was a mountain. This was a huge deal. This is one of the, uh, the, the first major problems that occurs within the church itself. This is huge. And the apostles still say, that's not within the spectrum of what we should be dealing with. We think you should handle this part because our work over here is that important. Our work over here of the ministry of the word and prayer and the focus on the proclamation of the word of God, this is what we as the leaders in the church should be really focusing on the spiritual nature of what's happening within the church, and these physical needs and stuff that's going on over here, that's important. It's vitally important, which is why you can resolve this. Notice that he, the apostles, I mean, if there was ever a group of people that would be qualified to micromanage everything that's taking place within the church, wouldn't it be the apostles? And they micromanage nothing here. They say, you know what? We're just going to let you do this. You choose the men. You figure out who should do this. You bring them to us, and we will approve what you have chosen. They don't go to them and say, oh, this is a problem. All right, we're going to you know, give us a list of men, and, and we're going to kind of go through them and bet them a little bit, and we'll interview and talk. No, they just said, y'all do this. Because what they were doing for the ministry of the word and the focus, prayer, um, and, and everything else, the remember pastors and teachers or shepherds and teachers, that role was so vitally important. They're not just a group of decision makers. They are a group that is all about the spiritual well-being of the church and the proclamation of the word of God. Elders guide and they serve the congregation, and they provide oversight in the spiritual matters of the church. Now, then again, there is uh, one term that is left to look at. We looked at the pastoring or shepherding, the overseeing, or being a bishop, and that last term is 
being an elder. Or this is where the word presbyter, that's, a, that's kind of a really older term now. Probably some of y'all are saying, I don't think I've even heard that term except for maybe Presbyterians. Uh, you know, you might hear of that. And that is because Presbyterians have a board of presbyters, which is part of the organization of their leadership. They have a board of elders or presbyters, which is why they got the name Presbyterians. Um, this word, though, elder, it's carryover from the Jewish community, and really it's a carryover, I would say, from any community that has ever existed. <laughs> um, any community at all that honors those who are older, who honors those who carry wisdom, uh, and they seek out that wisdom of those who are older, um, this is what that's all about. By the way, come back tonight that's kind of what we're going to be talking about, is that idea of wisdom, uh, and especially talking about it coming with those who are in this position of being older and how wisdom is gained and passed on. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, um, this is just in a law, just here's an example, where it says, uh, then the father of the young woman, her mother shall take and bring out the evidence of her virginity to the elders of the city in the gate. Um, this is just a law that demonstrates that in this particular scenario, uh, if there's questions concerning whether a woman is a virgin, you know, when she's going to get married and they're able to bring out the evidence, who adjudicates this? Who is it that stands and says yes or no? Who do they bring the evidence to in order to make a decision? Very specifically, it's brought to the elders. The elders, that's the term that is used. It's those who are wiser within the group. You see this in practice in Ruth chapter 4. We, you're familiar hopefully, with the story of Ruth, uh, that by the time you get to chapter 4, uh, Boaz has said, I will redeem you. But there is one other who has the right of redemption before me. And that has to be resolved. Well, how do they resolve the right of redemption? How do they determine uh, who will or will not redeem uh, the, the property and then also redeem uh, Ruth within the midst of this? And so it says in Ruth chapter 4, Boaz had gone up to the gate and he sat down. And behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, and sit down here. And he turned aside, and he sat down, and he took ten men, of whom? The elders of the city. And they said, Sit down here. So they sat down. And now that the elders of the city were here, they were able to go through the proceedings, and it was legally binding because the elders were the ones who adjudicated this. They were the ones who uh, stood in the balance to determine what should or shouldn't be done. We can see how this word is used in Jewish society. Really, understanding Christian society springs up uh, from Jewish society. These were the ones who provided guidance within the community. And they kind of had an official capacity to do so. They were there because of their age, their wisdom, their life experience. Hence the name, elder, which we understand means somebody who is older. These are the ones who naturally lead because they have lived their life gaining wisdom and understanding. They're respected. They're revered because their wisdom is called upon. The idea really is somebody who is walking down the path, the same path of life that we're walking, and they've made it further down that path. Therefore, they're wiser. They have more knowledge, more understanding. They've experienced life and wisdom because of that. Again, we'll talk about this tonight. For us, when we look at a man, we see this man is on a path to the best of our understanding, to the best of our knowledge. He's on a path to heaven. And we see the results of his actions. We see the results of the choices that he makes, the things that he does, the path that he's taken. And what we ultimately say is, when I am 
his age, I want to be where he is. And the only way to get there is to what? Follow him in order to get to where he is. That is the essence of what an elder is. And so we have these three descriptions of elders. Uh, bishops, pastors, shepherds, overseers, whatever you want to call them, whatever words you want to use. But here's the question. Why do we even need elders, leaders within the group? Why has there been an eldership in place here as far back, I believe, as living memory? Um, I, I think that there has been an eldership here as far back as anyone here is able to remember. Maybe. I think so. Someone might prove me wrong afterwards. But why have elders? Well, I think it's important to understand, first of all, this was a huge priority in the early church. In Acts chapter 14, uh, this is right after, you know, chapter 13 and 14, we call it Paul's first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas go through these cities here in the region of Galatia, and as they make their way through, they then make their way back through all of those cities before returning to Antioch, and just mere months at the most of having been in these cities starting churches, what are they doing? They're appointing elders in all of these churches. They made it a special point to find the men qualified, the leaders of these groups, and to make sure that these churches had leaders. Uh, Titus chapter 1, the whole purpose, when we look to Titus for what we call sometimes the qualifications uh, of elders, and we'll talk about those, and we'll, we'll discuss those probably in a couple weeks uh, from now. But what was the purpose for him to appoint elders in all the cities? This is a priority. Paul makes this a priority. They were obviously looking to appoint more of them in Ephesus than what they had because that was why Paul writes to Timothy in chapter 3 and brings it up, as we talked about earlier. And there are many things that are listed for elders to do, as we've talked about. A few that are uh, just as important that we really didn't have time to discuss, but here's the question. What would we do if there were no elders? We'd have to have some form of leadership and spiritual guidance within this church, wouldn't we? I mean, we can't just flounder uh, without any kind of leadership. There's always some kind of leadership that takes control. And if we didn't have elders, we'd have to devise some kind of system that is not biblical. Many today might use a business meeting model in this scenario. All men participate in the leadership of the church. But because not all men are necessarily or should necessarily be elders, two important things occur. Some things that need to be done are not done because nobody feels qualified to do them or to make those decisions. And thus, they just don't occur. On the other side, some things become done, or some things are done by unqualified men <laughs> that should be done by men who meet a specific qualification that we'll talk more on about in a couple weeks. In other places, somebody might take all of the work upon himself because nobody else is doing it. And he may not claim a title, but de facto he serves in that capacity doing all of that work by himself. Uh, there's a reason that there's usually a plurality, because it's a lot of work that gets broken up between the people who are serving. This one man often is the evangelist, because he's already teaching, he already has the authority in teaching, and everyone else, uh, it's a whole lot easier for everyone else just to dump the load on him and say, you know what, you're the guy. We're going to treat you like you are that guy, and he's simply given the load. By the way, this is one of the first things when I was 25 years old and started in St. Louis with the church there, I don't know, second or third lesson, I spent about 10 minutes saying, I am not an elder. I am not a pastor. I'm not a shepherd. 
please do not treat me as one. And I don't know if it was because my message was that effective or because everyone looked at me and said, yeah, he is not an elder. There is no wisdom there. They didn't treat me as one. And I'm very thankful for the fact that that wasn't dumped on me. Unfortunately, I know a lot of other younger preachers who got themselves into a situation where they were completely burnt out after just a few years because the church said, well, you are our de facto eldership. Good luck! And it totally wore them out, and many who aren't even preaching anymore. The single individual model does not match the New Testament model. Some places, they simply have no leadership. And unsurprisingly, not much gets done. Maybe just the absolute bare minimum, even if that. Consider for a moment, if we claim to be the New Testament church, if we claim to follow only the guidance and the direction of the New Testament, to only follow what we understand to be God's will from the pages of the New Testament, should we not be doubly sure that in one of the most important aspects of the church, its leadership, that we follow the New Testament command and teaching? At the same time, I think we need to be very careful in selecting those who are elders. And again, I'm previewing discussion that's going to come up in a couple weeks, but for now it's important to see that the primary focus of determining who is someone who should serve as an elder comes from the New Testament, yes, but we often turn to Timothy and Titus. We often say, okay, guys, it's time to see if we should have an elder. Let's talk about this list in Timothy, and then let's run over to Titus, and let's talk about this list in Titus. And let's have our list written down and let's take every man and let's set them beside this list. Do they check all the boxes? Oh boy, they do. All right, Whew. stick them in there. This man must be elder material. That actually misses the point of what those lists are all about. Again, this is in the bulletin. My whole take on this, you can find it in the bulletin and, and hopefully you'll have a chance to read through that. And uh, if you really don't want to, we'll probably talk about this in a couple weeks as well when we get back to this discussion. But let me suggest we should start the qualifications for an elder by looking at these. Is this someone who is older and wiser? Is this someone who is able to oversee? Is this someone who can shepherd the church of God? These are the things we should be looking for if we want to see if someone can be an elder. Now, those lists, they have a place, they have a part. We'll talk about those in a couple weeks. Absolutely, they're very important. Don't hear what I'm not saying? No one heard me say that we ignore Timothy and Titus, right? Okay, we, we absolutely use them, but we make sure we use them appropriately. What we're looking for is an older, wiser man, both relative terms, who's walking down the path to heaven in a way that invites others to follow him. He serves as a spiritual leader within the church. He has care and concern for every sheep within the flock, and he knows how and where to lead them. I understand when Paul tells Timothy in 1 Peter, uh, 1 P Timothy in 1 Peter, no, in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and in verse 22 when he says, do not lay hands quickly on an elder. Oftentimes we take that to mean uh, grabbing him in punishment. I think it means an appointment. Do not lay your hands hastily to appoint an elder until he has, you, you've gone through all the due diligence because however he acts in that church, that's going to reflect back on you as the evangelist who appointed him. But I want us to consider this. The men that we have right now, look at the ways that they demonstrate that they are qualified to serve in this capacity. Men who fulfill the descriptions of bishop, elder, 
pastor. And in a couple of weeks, we'll look more at the, the qualifications that you find the lists in Timothy Titus concerning it. But I think it's important that we understand those qualifications are actually not helpful unless we first see men who fit the descriptions of elder, overseer, and shepherd. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, gloriously enthroned uh, with all splendor, majesty, and glory, it is amazing how much you care about us and how much you provide for us. And we're thankful that we have these men here who serve in the capacity of leadership over us as a church and, and how they guide us in the paths of righteousness, just as they are guided by your Son. We ask your blessing of wisdom and guidance, that you would strengthen these shepherds here, that your will may be done, and through us you may be glorified. We thank you for the greatest shepherd, your Son, our Savior and the life that comes through him. And it is through Jesus, the good shepherd, we pray. Amen. Understanding the nature of who Jesus is. Jesus is the great shepherd. We sang a song earlier about how he will go off just to the one. He, he, uh, I mean, that's that important to him. And perhaps you are that one that he has been seeking, that he wants to bring back into his fold. This morning, if you are here and you recognize that you have been separated by God because of sin, you recognize that the shepherd is calling you to return, and you are ready to come back to God, to have your sins washed away by the blood of Christ and to return to be with him. Uh, we're going to sing song number 550 here in a second for Christ and the church. As we are singing this song, if you're ready to make that commitment to be baptized into the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, as we sing this song, simply come to the front, have a seat, and we'll assist you. I'll help you in any way. Please come forward now and we sing your invitation. For Christ and the church, let our voices ring. Let us honor the name of our own blessed King. Let us work with the will in the strength of youth and loyally stand for the kingdom of truth. For Christ, our dear Redeemer, for Christ, the crucified, for the church, his blood hath purchased, the church, his holy bride. For Christ and the church be our earnest prayer, let us follow his banner across daily bear. Let us yield, holy yield to the gospel power and serve faithfully every day, every hour. For Christ, our dear Redeemer, for Christ, the crucified, for the church his blood hath purchased, the church is holy bride. For Christ and the church, let us cast aside by his conquering grace, chains of self, fear, and pride. May our lives be enriched by an aim so grand, then happy the call to the Savior's right hand. For Christ, our dear Redeemer, for 
for Christ the crucified for the church his blood has purchased the church is holy bride thank you Chris for that lesson I'd like to thank everybody for coming this morning and spending the time to worship God. It's been good. It's been really good. If you're visiting with us, thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate your presence and we appreciate your, your willingness, again, to take the time out of your day to worship God, and hear a lesson from His Word. Do the elders or deacons have any other announcements that need to be made? Not seeing any. We'll be led in a word of prayer by Ben Huntley. You just bow with me. Lord, <coughs> just thank you for today. Thank you for the fact that we woke up this morning and can live in this creation that you've made. Thank you for everything you've given us, and thank you for this morning that we've had to worship you and glorify you. Please help it to have been encouraging and edifying to us, and help us to carry what we've learned here throughout the rest of the week, and to do your will throughout the rest of our lives. Thank you most of all for sending your son to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.